Well, with a title like that, I want you to take a wild guess what this game is about. That's right! Talking through your problems and befriending all of God's creatures and discovering the healing power of love. Just kidding, it's murder! This is the goriest game I've ever played, and when you name it Splatterhouse, I'd be disappointed with anything less. This game is a modern reboot of a classic arcade title, much in the same light as Doom 3 or recent Mortal Kombat's. Sadly, I never got to play those classic arcade games, being that I'm young, dumb, and full of subscribers! <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I can't express enough in words how much I appreciate all of you. Thank you. But enough kissing up to my lovely followers. Let's get down to it! This game is written by comic writer Gordon Rennie, who is known for Judge Dredd, Necronauts, Predator Nemesis, Sewer Patrol, and tons of other comics you've probably never heard of. See, I don't even have to do research, I can just look at the back of the box! And I love the dialogue and story in this game. We start with a pair of college kids entering a spooky mansion for reasons to be determined later, and they're soon greeted by a creepy mad scientist as well as a horde of monsters. Our main character, Rick the Hipster, is impaled while his girlfriend is kidnapped by the evil Dr. West. Rick's lifeless body falls into a display case and unleashes an ancient evil known only as... The Mask. After putting on the mask as a last-ditch effort to save his life, Rick succumbs to the power of his new John Cena bod and becomes a titan of pure punching power. Thus, we begin a ride of punching, more punching, even more punching, which graduates to stabbing, then to smashing, and we end on shooting. All this to save Rick's girlfriend, Jen. Man, this looks tiring. So, Rick and the Mask are both pretty interesting characters, actually. The Mask is a mischievous demon that thrives on blood and chaos. They cut it out! <laughs> then find more things for us to kill. Blood and carnage always make me feel more cooperative. He makes inappropriate jokes. <laughs> Look a bit <laughs> says poetic things about mass murder and Lovecraftian horrors rising from the abyss. They are everything and nothing. They inhabit the abyss, the gulf between what's said and what's understood, the place from whence stems all human suffering. Their famine, conflict, genocide. They are now and forever amen. And they are coming your way. And breaks the fourth wall. Show him why we call it Splatterhouse. This character couldn't be more perfect if they tried. To top it all off, he's voiced by Jim Cummings, also known as Winnie the Pooh and Darkwing Duck. Jesus, Rick, get it together. I asked you to trust me. First sight of blood, you're crying like a schoolgirl. For a dick, you are such a pussy. Oh, God, my childhood is vastly improved. Speaking of, Rick is a kind-hearted geek who wouldn't hurt a fly. Are they human? Used to be. A long time ago. What's the matter, kiddo? Weak stomach? But he's pushed into this crazy journey in which he becomes a blood-fueled maniac that murders demons and hordes of the undead by the planet load. The Mask is having a pretty good time with all this, but our relatable hero Rick very clearly just wants to go home. Oh, disgusting! How oh, would I give for some hand sanitizer? And no, you're hearing that right. This is Josh Keaton, my favorite voice actor of the Spectacular Spider-Man series. And, if you want to get really obscure, he's also Revolver Ocelot. This reload time is exhilarating. That one's for you, Jackson. This is an incredibly talented voice cast, and the two halves of our player character make this game so much better than if he was just silent the whole time. The back and forth is always interesting, and the game covers themes like atoning for one's sins and the ethics of killing to save another. A lot of implications are made about the origins of the antagonist throughout, and you have to collect all these audio logs to really get a full picture of what's going on. I also need to take note of the heavy metal soundtrack by Five Finger Death Punch, Mastodon, Lamb of God, and the Plasmas. The only thing missing was Slipknot. I love this soundtrack. So most of the music in this video will be from it, unless YouTube's not okay with that. I don't know, we'll see what happens. Now, you may be wondering when I'll talk about the gameplay, which for a lot of people is the main attraction, and to that I respond right now. It's a pretty standard character action game, or 
spectacle fighter for you anal retentive folk, but it manages to keep itself from getting boring by mixing it up so often. Every level has something new, like for example, you can't pass this area unless you kill all the enemies in a specific way, or here you can't slow down to fight because the ceiling keeps caving in. Hell, in this place the ground keeps opening up into giant spinning fan blades designed to grind up bodies and you have to stay clear of it. The varying environments and enemy patterns keep it from feeling repetitive. And did I mention this game was gory? Well, Rick can do fatalities. Call them finishing moves if it will help you sleep at night, but they're just fatalities. The entire area goes dark and you have to follow certain inputs to finish the enemies in cartoonishly bloody ways. There's a lot of these animations across all the game's enemy types, but they do raise the question of whether Rick is that sane to begin with. Given these circumstances, I could see a normal person tearing a monster's head off with their newfound superpowers, but ripping its head in half and pulling out its lungs and slamming them into the ground? That's a bit much. Still within the realm of reason, though. Then we get to the savage disemboweling through their anus! Holy shit, Rick! Settle down! See, that's the kind of shit that got us an M rating. Oh, and you can pick up weapons, too. The weapon selection's pretty similar to The Last of Us. Wooden board, lead pipe, machete. The only thing Joel didn't pick up was a chainsaw. And this game makes them exactly as powerful as you want them to be. You hit someone with a pipe and they go flying. You slice someone in half with a meat cleaver, they turn to bits after one hit. The power in the weapons makes you want to think strategically about how you'll use them going into a fight, because there is weapon degradation. So you'll start hacking up the toughest enemy in a room with the blade, dispose of it in a spectacularly violent fashion, and then use your strongest power on all of the goons left behind. But I'll get to that. This character is powered by monster blood, not unlike the guy from Bloodborne, though this came out first and has way more fun with the concept. You have Wolverine-style healing powers that are activated by consuming blood, so you'll find yourself trying to find the biggest puddles of it in combat. Look at this place. It's like Hannibal Lecter's house after a dinner party. You can also actively drain blood from enemies by pressing a trigger button and hammering circle or B. This stops all the enemies in their tracks long enough for you to fully heal yourself at the cost of one bar of your meter. If you keep battering bad guys, your meter fills up and you can turn on, uh, mask mode? Well, the mask takes over and Rick becomes even more badass as he cuts enemies to ribbons. I also love how you become the same size as any of the bosses in this mode. Well, most of them anyway. What a great segue! The bosses are awesome! Eat your heart out, Resident Evil! My favorite is probably the first one, which is this doll that can telekinetically move objects around itself to create a suit of armor out of pieces of scenery from the house. This fight involves you ripping this huge enemy apart in whatever way you can. It's one of the highlights of the game alongside the chainsaw-wielding demon that teleports when the lights are off. By the way, this game often pays respects to its arcade roots with side-scrolling sections that amazingly don't kill the flow of the game. These are actually pretty cool, and more interesting than just walking down a straight hallway the way you normally would. And they do a lot of cool tricks with the three-dimensional perspective. Ooh, collectibles! Uh... What's this? Okay, so Rick's girlfriend leaves torn pictures of herself as a trail so he can find her. But some of these pictures are pretty tame, and others are... <sighs> Whoa! Well, uh... Well, you know, I mean, being a perfectionist and all, I'm sure there's an achievement for getting every single one. Oh god, I gotta find them all! This game this is sexy. a male power the women in refrigerators. The camera isn't so focusing enough here. on Rick's ass. I'm triggered. Look, all of those are valid arguments, but I refute them on the grounds of fuck you chainsaw fight and special guest appearance by Cthulhu trapped in a giant fish tank. Wish I could fight him, but what are you gonna do? He's got his own stuff going on in life right now. He seems busy. I'm sure if someone was a fan of those old arcade games, you may be impressed with all the changes or disappointed that it just isn't the same. Well, fear not. This game, much like Doom 3 BFG Edition, contains ports of all of the original games that led up to this one. So if you want to take a fun nostalgia trip, you could totally do that. No, I won't review the side-scroller games because I'm bad at them. I suck at old games. Don't ask me why, but if it's before the PS1, I'm bad at it. I can't even play Mega Man, I'm so inept! 
Of course, I have to talk about the stuff that I don't like in the game, too. There are these segments when they want you to do some Uncharted-style climbing sequences, and the system for doing them is very clunky and almost always takes multiple tries to do. Failing them is annoying because the checkpoints are sort of unforgiving, and while this game isn't too hard, dying a few times from something really cheap is sort of inevitable. Loading times are also sort of long, but I'm forgiving to that sort of thing because this game is six years old after all. The fatality animations are awesome and all, but there's only so many of them they can make and you might start getting bored of them after seeing the same four used over and over again. Eventually you start wanting them to go faster, then you get to this mindset where you're okay with them as long as you get to do something while they happen, like lean over and drink a soda or check a text message while it finishes. There also isn't much variation in the enemy types. You essentially fight the same 10 enemy types over and over, and they just get bigger and tougher as it goes. Something that isn't really a flaw, but definitely a turnoff for some people, is the fact that this game is incredibly difficult towards the end. Enemies that are used as bosses in the earlier levels return just as average enemy types, and it can start to feel a little overwhelming when you have so many giant monsters to fight at once. I mean, look at this! These enemies do damage to you when you touch them, but there isn't any weapons in the room, and your health is just worn down by two bosses simultaneously. It's not impossible, but damn is it a challenge. If you're one of those Dark Souls masochists, I highly suggest you crank this shit to the hardest difficulty and give it a shot. Oh, come on, really? There's so much everything happening! Thankfully, these are my biggest complaints, and it's a solid game despite them. It's okay, I handled it. So without spoiling the story too much, it takes you to a lot of locations across time and space. The early levels have a great haunted house vibe, and the later ones give you this glimpse into the creepiest post-apocalypse I've seen in a long time, as well as a horror-themed amusement park, and some looks into a cracked version of reality. I won't give away details because I really want you to play this for yourself, but the ending just begs for a sequel that sadly never got made. I'm sorry to report that the entire development team was laid off from Namco Bandai shortly after the game's release, and this one flew pretty far under the radar for the gaming world, further ruining this game's chances at a follow-up. So many people haven't heard of this game, and that's a tragedy if I've ever seen one. Hey, your nutsack's not fused to your chin, right? I'd consider that a successful trend. I say this game is an underrated gem of the action genre, and if this sort of thing is your cup of tea, go pick up a copy and check it out. This game's neato. Unless you're a no-fun Daniel Do-Gooder who is shocked by bad language, in which case just go play Wolverine Origins. No one cusses in that game, it's weird. You never forget your first kill. Ah! Oh shit! Oh! These things hurt! Oh, I'm sorry. Did your vagina just say something? Ah, oh, good times. 